So I'm just going to summarize a little bit about record deals and publishing deals and a little bit about management and where managers fit in. Um, we've already talked about quite a lot of that today, mainly in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll just run through it in a slightly more organized fashion so we can think about what record deals look like and how publishing deals differ, and then a little bit about management. And then we'll wrap up for today, and then tomorrow we'll regroup in the morning to look at digital and the digital market, which digital services have gained the most traction and how digital licensing works. And then I'll give some thoughts about how you could be evolving your businesses as artists or labels or promoters, and then that can feed into the conversations about business development and building a brand that will follow. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about deals and management, then we'll take any final questions, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So let's uh, have this uh, back on the screen. This is the music industry, as uh, laid out before, the different sorts of music companies that artists work with. And so when you have a new artist, new artists start out with, with no deals in place. Okay? So there's just the artist. And then the artist slowly builds a little team around themselves. And the ultimate aim is to get some management involved. And then we start doing deals around each of our different revenue streams. One of the questions for new artists, and once management are on board for managers, is, well, which deals are we prioritizing? Which deals are relevant to us? Which deals do we need? I mean, one of the things we talked about just after lunch is, you know, at what point do you need a publisher? Initially, you know, you, you, you join the society, you make sure all your details logged, and for, you know, for a while that can just tick along, a little bit of money might be coming in. At what point, actually, no, now we need a publisher. Uh, merchandise, we can do print-on-demand tickets, we set it up on a website, it all works, easy, do that ourselves. At what point do we think, actually, no, it would be good to get a third party involved in this work? Um, when artists start doing the deals, some of these companies, artists are probably never going to have a direct relationship with. Often artists do direct deals with a number of business partners, and then through those primary business partners, they get access to secondary business partners. Um, so for example, you, know, you, you may sign to a publisher, you may sign to a label. If you sign to a publisher, you don't need a rights administrator because that's one of the jobs that the publisher provides. And they either do that in-house or they farm it out to a third party. So small independent publishers may use something like a cobalt to actually do the administration. Bigger publishers have that in-house. Distribution. The bigger labels are distributors. So once you've got a label deal, you don't need a distributor because the label can either do that in-house or the label has a distribution deal in place and you piggyback on the back of that. Um, so you'll have an agent and a promoter. Okay? Through the agent, you'll start working with promoters. At that point, you probably don't need to have a direct relationship with venues because the promoter will sort that out. You probably don't need to worry about ticketing agencies because the promoter will sort that out. Unless, of course, you have preferences on venues and preferences on ticketing companies, in which case you might start to have some direct deals. But the point is, as an artist and with management, you're looking to do a number of different deals. But through those deals, you now get access to some of the other business partners in the equation that you will not have direct relationships with. Either because they don't want direct relationships with you. So when it comes to retail, um, you know, the local record shop might gladly have a relationship with you and you can take your CDs in. Amazon hasn't got time to have a direct relationship with you. Amazon wants to have a relationship with your distributor. Spotify, they love artists, but there just isn't enough time in the day to have, to have conversations with every artist. So Spotify doesn't want to have a direct relationship with you. They want to have direct relationships with labels and distributors, and so you have to have that middleman. Another reason why sometimes you don't have a direct relationship is the assumption is when we're working with new artists, the new artist doesn't have any money. So when the new artist is doing their first business partnerships, the assumption of the deal is we can't pay you any money. I, the artist, can't pay you the label, you the publisher, you the merchandiser, you the agent, you the promoter, can't pay you any money. I can give you a cut of future revenue. I can give you a slice of the pie down the line. But as we've said several times today, 10% of nothing is nothing. Um, so at the outset, you're going to business partners and saying, I need you to work for free. Okay? And you're going to have to invest your time for free. You may have to put a bit of money on the table for free on the promise of money to come. 
Some business partners won't do that. Uh, you know, no CD pressing company is going to pressure up CDs because they love your music. So, so, so you need to find a label that loves your music who will then pay the pressing company. Um, most marketing and PR people don't work for free. Okay, most marketing and PR people are looking to be paid from the word go. There are some exceptions to that, but in the main, a publicist needs at least a little bit of money from the outset. You haven't got any money. So therefore, you need a label who will then pay the publicist. So you have direct relationships with some business partners and then indirect relationships with others, either because the, the, some partners don't want to talk to you as a standalone artist or they want paying and you can't afford to pay them. When we do our deals, you choose which partners are relevant to you. Also, you know, it's not always your decision, is it? It's which partners will work with you. Okay, so at what stage of your career do you need partners and can you get partners? Um, and sometimes, obviously, at the outset, people won't want to work with you because, remember, they have to work for you for free. Um, and so they need to be confident that there is some future revenue in which to share. And so that's why you, you need to start doing everything for yourself initially. You need to have your music on YouTube and SoundCloud and the streaming services. You're not going to make any money from that, okay? Don't be putting it up there thinking, oh, that's it, I'm going to make money. You won't make much money, if any, but it's, it's showing that you're open for business. You need to start gigging, even though you may not be making much money from gigging, to show you're open for business. And then business partners may start to show an interest. Um, you might reach a point, which is a nice point to reach, where people start to show an interest and then you and management have to decide, is it right? Is it ready? Okay, is it, is it, am I ready to, to do a publishing deal where I have to give up 40% of all the income that's going to come in? Or actually, should we wait for a couple of years and try and get a more favourable deal down the line? So initially, it's like, who the hell will work with us? And then once people are ready to work with you, it's like, well, who do we actually need on our team? At what point should we do the deal? Once you do the deal, you then have to work out, well, what is the terms of the agreement that we do? Um, so who will cover the business partner's upfront costs? Okay, so the minute people start working for you, they're investing time and they're probably investing some money. Even if it's just phone calls and postage and the occasional taxi, um, they start spending money on your behalf. Uh, is that that their cost? Or will they charge that to you? Will they be able to take that out of any money that comes in before they share the income with you? So we need to be clear about who's paying for what and what happens in terms of getting that money back. Are these people charging you a fee or are they on a profit share or a revenue share? Okay, if the deal is 20%, 20% of what? Okay, is it 20% before costs are taken out or 20% after? Is it 20% of gross, including any taxes that need to be paid? Or is it 20% once sales taxes have been taken off? All of these things need to be there in the agreement. How long is this deal going to last for? With copyright deals, it's usually a certain number of releases or a certain number of published works. With other deals, it will usually be a period of time. And so you have to agree how long are we going to work together. Um, and what happens if we fall out in, 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 in amongst all of that? Well, what are we going to do when we fall out? Are we, are, we, are we going to have a way that we can break the deal and both sides come out of that all right, or what? Is there exclusivity? Okay, labels and publishing deals are usually exclusivity deals. Okay, that might be regional exclusivity, not global, but generally you do a deal with my label and that's it. No recordings for anyone else until my record deal is complete. Whereas it may be with live, with promoters, you don't do exclusivity deals. I, I'll, do, I'll tour with you for a 10 date tour, but once that's over, I can go and work with anyone I like and actually I could go and do other gigs out you know, elsewhere in the world with other promoters at the same time. So what are the exclusivity? And wherever intellectual property is created, who owns it? So with a record deal and a publishing deal, that's a given. But with things like um, live, okay, what if you've got someone filming backstage while you're doing the tour? Who owns the intellectual property in that? Okay, can the promoter go off and then you know, make money out of that once you're famous? What about the poster for the tour that you could then be selling online and making more? Who owns all of the intellectual property? Make sure all of that is agreed. Now, as I said earlier, in terms of deals that are done in the music industry, some are very formal and they're big, thick contracts. A lawyer charges you $5,000 to write. Other deals are done on a handshake. And it is amazing how many deals in this industry across the world Big deals are done on a handshake. Um, and some managers would say, 
there are plenty of managers who have been, you know, lost out with their artists and now insist on thick contracts. Other managers say management is all about trust between the artist and the manager. The contract's worthless. You can't enforce a management contract. It's all about trust. We either trust each other or we don't. Now, with my lawyer hat on, I would say, yeah, that doesn't work in court. OK, let's write down the basics. But there are plenty of people who do deals on a handshake. And as I say, agents in particular are often on a handshake. Um, so that's a decision to make. You know, you don't want to spend all of your money on legal. But I would say, at the very least, one of the reasons for writing things down is just to be sure that we, we both have the same understanding. It's amazing how often I'll sit in rooms where two people will have a conversation and then we leave and then the two sides of that conversation have very different opinions about what was said in the room. Um, and that's where a, a really simple written agreement can, can overcome that. So if, 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 if two people have misunderstood, let's get that sorted now and not in five years' time when there's lots of money on the table. So although plenty of deals are done on a handshake, I would say just get the basics down and have both sides agree that at the very least, we, we, uh, today, we understand what we uh, believe to be happening. Usually how it has traditionally worked, and in many cases still works, is that artists start to do deals with business partners once they reach the right stage in their career. Hopefully they've got management in place. They ought to have legal in place. I don't know how it works here. Um, certainly in Europe and North America now, when you're doing a big deal, like a label deal or a publishing deal, actually the label and the publisher will insist that you, the artist, have legal representation. Um, some of them will even pay for it. Now you might think, well, why would they do that? Why is it in the label's interest to make sure that the artist has a lawyer? Bearing in mind the first thing a lawyer does with a label contract is they pull it to pieces and they start putting red lines through things. And it's because in North America and Europe there have been cases where the label has a deal, but the the artist took no legal representation. Then there's a dispute, and the artist goes to court and says, I was 18 years old, I signed a piece of paper, I had no idea what I was signing. And there have been some big cases where the judge has said, you know what, you're right, and so we're going to make this contract void. So now it's in the interests of the label to ensure that the artist had legal advice. So when the artist tries to come in and say, I didn't know what I was signing, it was like, well, you know, we paid you to have a lawyer. So that's your fault, not our fault, and therefore the contract will stand. But different conventions around the world. We start to do multiple deals as, as the momentum starts to gain. Remember, the starting point of all of these deals is we have no money. So you need to work for us for free and possibly give us a little bit of budget on the promise of money to come. However, even if you can persuade six business partners to take over different parts of your business on the promise of money to come, and they're all working for free and they're covering phone costs and maybe setting up the website costs and things like that. But remember what we said right at the start of the day. Okay, the first thing that you need as artists is you need money to live off. Okay, so at the very least, you need someone to give you the money to give up the day job to focus on your music full time. Also, most new artists need a big marketing campaign. They've been getting a bit of momentum going, a few fans signing up, playing some gigs, doing some social, putting out some releases. But what we now need is a really good planned marketing campaign. And that was going to involve some money. And so what traditionally artists have done is they've got various business partners in place, they're all working for free, and then they look to one of those partners to not only work for free and to not only provide a little bit of budget, but to also write a check and put a big pile of cash on the table. And usually that's the record deal. And that's why even though a record deal will not be your first deal, well, it probably shouldn't be your first deal, management should be in place first, um, most people these days have a booking agent before they have a label, but the label deal is still often the most important deal because it's the cash investment. It's the first business partner to put serious cash on the table, both for you as an artist, but also um, to fund a big marketing campaign around your debut album. When I say a big pile of cash, I mean it can be a few thousand dollars, it can be a million dollars. Okay? It depends on the label, it depends on the artist, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, it depends on how much money the label thinks they can make down the line. Um, and obviously the big record companies generally spend more money than the little record companies. But let's have a quick think about what record deals look like. So, a classic record deal involves the record company committing to spend money on a bunch of things. So first of all, a classic record deal includes an advance. Okay, so that's money that you get, goes in your bank account, and you can do whatever you like with that money. 
the money's there for you to live off for the next 18 months. So sen the sensible person banks it in a savings account and then lets a twelfth of the money come through to their current account once a month and they, they, they drip feed the money. But you could have one hell of a party if you'd like. The problem then is you're now committed to work full time for the label for the next 18 months and you've got no money to pay the rent. That's when you do the publishing deal and you learn on second deal not to waste all the money. The label isn't just paying in advance. The label is also committing to, to do a launch marketing campaign around a debut album. Um, and so they are investing in recording that album, making it the best possible album, possibly bringing in producers and other songwriters and engineers to get the best possible launch album. They're then going to distribute it, and if, if they think that CDs are still required, they're going to press up the CDs, and then they're going to do the marketing. And actually, in the main, the marketing is the most important bit. And some of that is in-house. They've got in-house marketing people. Some of it is we're going to hire marketing agencies. Some of it is we're going to buy advertising. And as I say, for big pop releases, advertising is still important. That includes Facebook advertising, so there's a little bit of social media applied there. But advertising is still important for pop releases, but for some other releases, it's not required. Um, and again, that's for artist and management to decide. How much money do we need? Because if it's a million dollar record contract, um, you have to pay that money back. Okay, the label's going to make that money back. Okay, and so the more money the label spends, the longer it is going to take to pay the label back out of your royalties. And most managers, the minute you do a record deal, because they've put in all the money, they get a bunch of control with it. And managers hate that. They hate the fact that the label now says, we are the investor. Until we've made our money back, we're in control. And the quicker you, make, you pay the money back, the quicker you get the control back. So managers have to make a decision. Is it that we want a big check up front, because the manager's getting 20% of that, remember? And we want a big expensive marketing campaign, because that's what we need to launch. But it may take us five years, 10 years, 20 years to pay that money back through our record sales. Or do we want a more modest deal, but we think that we can, we can recoup on that contract in two years? and then we'll get control back. And these are decisions for everybody to make. The idea of that record deal is that it's the investment that will launch the artist, take you from slowly, organically growing your fan base to we've arrived and we grab a, a significant number of new fans that we can then sell tickets to and T-shirts to and so on and so forth. So this is what labels provide. It's nice of them, isn't it? What do labels want in return? And the, the two core elements of a classic record contract are copyright assignment and exclusivity. Okay? We, the record company, will own all of the sound recording copyrights that come out of this deal. And you'll be locked into me now for the next five albums, quite commonly. It's a one-way commitment. I'm only obliged to release one of those albums. But if I choose to take them, you're obliged to deliver me five. The fifth might be a greatest hits. Um, I own all the copyright, and until this deal is complete, you can't work with another label. Okay? I have the exclusive rights to your sound recordings. And if you go off and do a recording with another label, I'll get the copyright in that. So, so you are obliged to only record for me. Every record deal is different, but if you sign to a traditional record deal, and certainly if you sign to a major record company, for new talent, assignment and exclusivity are a given of the deal and very hard to negotiate out. The other key part of the deal is the artist royalty. So the, the label now owns the copyright. The label monetizes that content. But they commit to pay the artist a share of the money they make. However, there are some uh, sides here. First of all, we'll watch share. And that's for you and the label to decide. Okay? Copyright law beyond performer, performing rights, remember, equitable enumeration, copyright law has no opinion on this. Okay? It could be a 2% royalty. Okay, it could be a 5% royalty. Most bands who signed to record companies in the 60s, that's the royalty. They are still on all these years later. A 5% royalty. Okay, so the label gets to keep 95% of the money. These days, a major label deal will be something closer to a 15 to 20% royalty for the artist. There are some indies that will do you a 50-50 rev share. Okay, so, so every deal is different and it's for you to negotiate. Obviously, more established talent can get much more favorable deals. But new talent, where they're very risky, generally the label will keep the majority of the money, beyond the performer ER that's coming in through the collecting societies. Beyond that, two other things to remember. First of all, the label is allowed to recoup some of its investment before paying you a penny. Okay, so the, the, the advances are given. Okay, we get to take back your advance out of your royalties before we pay you a penny. 
Labels often these days will also make other things recoupable expenses. Anything we spend on advertising, we can claim that out of your royalties before we pay you a penny. And that's for you to decide in the contract. What is a recoupable expense? Labels often can also deduct other charges as they go. Okay, so um, every year we do a little bit more marketing and we'll, we'll, we'll charge you a bit more money and take that off before we give you your percentage. So these are the clauses of the record contract that you really have to look at. As I said earlier, I think um, every lawyer will say, it's, it's fine being on 20% cut, 20% of what? Okay, when is that 20% worked out? Um, because there are some artists on really bad record deals that by the time all the deductions are taken out, there ain't anything left to have 20% of. And this is where tensions between artists and labels uh, really kick off. Um, I mentioned earlier, just to remind you, the one exception to all of this is performing rights income, which in most countries is subject to equitable numeration through the collecting society. So you're getting 50% of the money from day one. It is not subject to recruitment. It is not subject to deductions. It doesn't go through the record company's bank account. It comes to you directly. Although remember, this is a relatively small revenue stream overall. And also, if you've got 22 session musicians on your track, you've got to share it with the session musicians as well. Just very quickly, uh, record companies get a bit of a bad reputation. Uh, everyone loves to slag off record labels. Generally, the mantra is, isn't it, that the indie labels are all lovely and the major labels are evil. Um, there are bad indie labels and there are good major labels. Um, record labels get a bad reputation. Why? Well, there are various reasons. First of all, that investment does not guarantee success. Okay? More artists who sign label deals don't recoup on their contract than do. Okay, so more label deals fail than succeed. Um, so just because you've been signed to a label, even if you're signed to Universal Music and they're spending a million dollars, it does not mean you're going to be successful. So there's a bit of managing expectations. Labels historically have a, have a practice of telling artists, you're a rock star now, this is it, you're going to be massive, and then two years later saying, oh, sorry, it didn't work out, you're dropped. And, and artists who've been touring in those two years are like, well, what happened? At what point did we cease to being rock stars and now we're dropped? <laughs> Oh, well, we'll cut, let, let me finish and then we'll take the questions because I've, I've not got a huge amount more to say. Um, labels may interfere artistically, okay? We all know those stories of the label that interfered. Um, and, you know, they spend a million dollars on you. You then bring in a really weird, quirky album that might be artistically interesting, but no one's going to buy. Of course, the label's going to say no. Also, I mean, I think. A&Rs at labels, what part of their job is to get the best out of the artist. And sometimes what happens with the artist is they go into the studio, they're surrounded by their friends, they're surrounded by, you know, everyone wants to say yes to the artist. And sometimes it's good to have someone who says to the artist, do you know what, this isn't good enough. Go back to the studio and do it again, because I know you can do better than that. And that's one of the jobs of the A&R at the label. Sometimes the A&R is wrong and they screw it up. Other times they're right, and that's why the final recording is, is the best possible recording. Labels sometimes mess up the marketing, or they overspend, and they, 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 they don't do a very good job. Labels and artists just fall out. Most business partnerships end eventually, acrimoniously. And what happens when a label and an artist falls out is the artist goes and does the media cycle and tells all the journalists and radio presenters why the label's evil, and the label just has to take it on the chin and, 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 and sit in the background and accept all that bad press. Um, artists often resent having signed over the rights to their first albums. For a lot of artists, those are actually the best albums they'll ever make. You know, if we're being honest, very few artists really cracked it on album seven. Um, so, so often you are assigning the rights to what will be your best ever work. Um, and a lot of artists subsequently grow to resent that, especially if they can't negotiate it back. A lot of artists ultimately negotiate it back. Um, but those that don't resent that. And of course, most labels are ultimately profit-driven companies. Um, and artists generally don't mind about that when they're doing the deal, but then once they fall out of the label, the fact that there are shareholders taking a profit. Uh, with the major labels, there are executives at the top that are earning way more than you will ever earn, and, and artists come to resent that. Um, and, but it's something you should be aware of when you're going into the deal. Despite all of this, I'm actually a bit of a, I quite like the label system. The fact that the music industry, for all of its issues and problems, we have commercial entities that are incentivized to invest in new talent. Okay, most other cultural industries look to government to invest in new talent. Whereas in the music industry, obviously there is some great 
government funding out there, and that's important. But ultimately, we look to corporate entities to invest in new talent. Um, and they are incentivized to do so, A, because copyright runs out eventually, and B, because as a label, the best deals are the new, new talent deals that go right. Okay? Most new talent deals go bad and you never make any money. But when a new talent deal goes right, that's where you make your money. Okay, if you were to sign, um, I don't know, if you, well, can't get Jay-Z because he's on the Rock Nation thing. If you, if you sign Kanye today to a deal, that deal is going to be so swayed in his favor because he's a massive superstar that actually you're not going to make a huge amount of money on that deal even when it's hugely successful. Whereas if you sign the next Kanye on first deal where you get 80% of the revenue, for those four or five albums, you're going to make a lot of money. So the system is set up to incentivize labels to be constantly looking and investing in new talent. And I think that's great. Um, and you know, th this is basically how it works. Um, most major labels have about a one in 10 success rate. Remember that when you're signing for a major label. You, you may be in the 90%. But the way the late majors work is we sign 10 artists. Of those 10 artists, 9 we will never make our money back. Or we might make our money back but we'll never go into profit. It's worth mentioning that even if an artist fails for the major, it doesn't actually mean the artist has failed. There's lots of artists that do a major label deal. The major label never makes their money back. But over those 5-6 years of marketing the artist builds a big enough fan base that they can now tour for the rest of their life. So the label doesn't make any money, but the artist builds the fan base that now they can live off. They're not going to be millionaires, but they can, they can live off that money. And there's a lot of artists like that. But the label won't make a profit on most of the artists it signs. But one in ten, they make a profit, it's a big profit, and then they A, get some money to keep, and B, they reinvest some of that money into the next set of ten. And so I like that model, and other cultural industries are weaker because they don't have it. Just very quickly, publishing deals. I've already alluded to most of this. There are lots of similarities between record deals and publishing deals, but there are also differences. The publisher also pays in advance. The publisher also brings other services to the table. So a bit of A&R, artist development. They manage all of your rights. They do all the admin. Increasingly, publishers are looking for sync deals for songwriters and maybe original commissions um, and, and, and work, you know, to work on, on, on film projects or theatre projects or whatever. So the publisher brings money to the table but also other services as well. They will also want assignment of copyright. That's a classic publishing deal. You can do an administration deal where you get the services on a rev share, but a traditional publishing deal, they want assignment of copyright. As I say, in, in many countries, whereas with a label deal, they'll want assignment of copyright for life of copyright, um, with publishing deals, it's more common to say, OK, you get a 10-year assignment, a 20-year assignment. That's not true in all territories. Some mainland Europe territories, it's still life of copyright. But in the UK now, as a new songwriter, you would never do a life of copyright deal. You'll, you'll do it for a certain period of time. Um, just like the record deal, the publisher pays a royalty once they've recouped their advance. Usually the songwriter will see the majority of the money. The collective licensing system actually generally forces a 50-50 minimum so that the songwriter has to see at least 50% of the money. And actually most songwriters will probably be on a 60-70% in, in the UK and the US now big name songwriters may be on as high as a 90% deal, but uh, it varies from country to country, but crucially it will be at least a 50-50, unlike the label deal. As we've already discussed, unlike label deals, the deals often exclude certain elements of the copyright which are actually assigned to the collecting society, and then the, the collecting society pays 50% of income to the publisher and 50% to the songwriter. Um, so there is that extra element of publishing deals that is different to label deals. That's not the case in the US, but it is in most other countries. Quite which controls get assigned to the society varies from country to country. So remember, the, the, the UK model, performing rights, PRS actually controls, pays 50-50 to songwriter and publisher, and then the publisher takes all of the other controls and does with that what they wish, sometimes licensing collectively through MCPS, sometimes licensing directly. Okay, I'll quickly talk about evolving deals, then I'll take some questions, and then I'll just give some thoughts about management before we finish. So the first thing to say about how record deals and publishing deals are changing, I've alluded to this already today. Traditionally, assignment was a given in record deals and publishing deals. We get the copyright. However, as I said, a lot of labels will provide you their services on a revenue share basis, a lot of publishers will provide you their services on a revenue share basis if they're not being asked to make a big upfront cash expenditure. So if you're not looking for big sums of money, 
Maybe you're looking for a little bit of marketing support and then distribution and admin. There are labels who will do that deal without assignment. The minute you start asking for 25,000 up front, assignment, okay? But where you're asking for less, and particularly of established artists, where the risk is a lot lower, you can do deals where you get access to the services without assigning copyright. And these deals are becoming more common, particularly for established artists. Established artists like keeping their copyright. And so they'll take a lower upfront, they'll, take, they'll, they'll waive the advance, they'll, they'll, they'll probably provide the recording ready-made so the label doesn't have the recording costs, and they'll say, we keep the uh, copyright, but you provide us of the other services and take X percent of the money. Okay, um, but we keep the copyright. More people are doing those deals. Many labels now have a separate division called label services that exists just to do those deals. Um, and there are companies out there who just do these deals. Sometimes they're called services deals, sometimes they're called licensing deals. In the olden days, we called them distribution deals on the recording side and administration deals on the publishing side. And as I say, they're becoming more common, especially for established talent. Somebody talked about 360 degree deals earlier. Okay, the flip side of that is, if you still want a big upfront investment from a label, what many labels and certainly major labels will now say is, as well as ownership of the sound recordings and 80% of all future sound recording income, we need more. Okay, old school record deals, it was sound recordings and that's it. Okay, I take the sound recordings, I, okay, I, I, I own the copyright, I keep all, most of the money, but everything else, all those other revenue streams we talked about earlier, you keep those, artist, I'll just do the recordings, I'll get you big and famous, and then you go and make money with ticketing and publishing and merchandise and everything else. However, labels are now often asking for a cut of the other revenue streams. Why? Well, what I said earlier. Recorded music lost a half of its value in revenue terms between 2000 and 2010. It's harder making money out of recorded music today than it was in the 1990s. And so the labels are saying, if we are going to continue to be the primary investors in new talent, we need a cut of something else to justify that. And so a lot of record companies now will ask for cuts of other revenue streams um, because they have less profit, which means they have less to invest, which means that they need to cut back their risks. And they either cut back their risks by signing less artists or by signing artists later. So rather than signing them on gut instinct and one good gig, they say, no, you go and do your own thing for 18 months. We'll see what your stats are like, and then perhaps we'll sign you. Um, or they take a cut of other revenue streams to reduce the risk. Actually, it's probably a combination of all three. So that created a question for artists and managers. When labels about 10 years ago started to say, do you know what, we're going to need a cut of other revenue streams, artists and managers had to say, well, which revenue streams and on what terms? Are we going to have to give you 50% of merch? Because we're currently living off merch, and if we have to start giving you 50%, that ain't going to work for us. Unless you can help us sell twice as many t-shirts. And if you help us sell twice as many t-shirts, then actually our 50% will be worth more than our current 100%. So that, those are the conversations that are going on. The majors generally like to get involved in merchandise, brand partnerships, and direct to fan. They don't want to get involved in live, because live's a whole new industry, although they might ask for 10% of, of, of your ticket sales. Um, they generally don't get involved in publishing, because they've got a sister publishing company they don't want to compete with, but they might ask for 10% of whatever you make from your publishing deal. This is for artists to decide, and, and uh, every deal is different. The lawyer gets the deal, and basically the label asks for everything. The lawyer goes through and crosses everything out, and then you go backwards and forwards until you reach a deal. Um, but artists and managers and labels are all trying to learn what these deals should look like. There are still some indies who do straight record deals. And as an artist, you might be attracted to that, although they're probably spending less money. So you have to make that decision. I said when all of this started 10 years ago, artists and managers had to work out what are these deals going to look like. Some managers back then started to say, well, perhaps this is an opportunity to cut the labels out entirely. Because we always used to fall out with the labels. We never liked giving up control to the labels. Um, it's easier to distribute music now. It's easier to make music now. And now the labels are telling us they want a cut of other revenue streams. Is this opportunity to cut the labels out? Because remember, they'll sell us their services. They'll sell us distribution. They'll sell us marketing. Is there a way here of cutting the labels out? 
In the main, for new talent, managers have not managed to cut the labels out. They still need that investment, and generally, labels are the best place to go for that investment. Um, with more established artists, you are starting to see managers taking more control, doing a services deal to get the distribution and a bit of marketing, and then the, la the management running the, the shop rather than the label. Which brings us to this final point, and I'll just leave you with this, and I'll take some questions before we wrap up. The role of management has changed over the last 10 years, and I would argue it's becoming more important. And there are various reasons for that. First of all, for new artists, label deals are often coming later. So whereas art labels might have signed an artist a year, 18 months in, often now they're signing the artist three years in. Someone has to do all the work in those two years, and generally that's management. So management are doing more of the work at the outset. For more established artists, they're doing services deals. Management now have to do more of the work. Also, there's an argument. We're going to talk tomorrow and on Friday about the potential of direct-to-fan. We talked about it earlier when we looked at the fan relationship side of the music industry. Arguably, to get the most out of direct-to-fan and actually to get the most out of streaming, the old-fashioned 12-week marketing campaign around an album release, which is what labels do, is becoming less and less effective. Artists now need to be engaging and communicating and doing interesting things all the time. Can the label do that? Because labels traditionally put out a record, do a big bit of marketing, then stop thinking about that artist for two years until another album comes around. So managers are getting more involved in marketing and fan communications than they ever did before. Now, for more entrepreneurial managers, this is quite exciting. Because rather than every artist basically doing the same set of deals, so once I'm engaged, I've got to find a label deal, then a publishing deal, then an agent, then a promoter, and then once the deals are done, I'm the middleman. There's now the opportunity to say, no, no, no. OK, before we do any deals, this is the artist. This is the fan base. This is the business. I'm now going to structure that business in a way that will work for everybody. And I will choose my deals carefully. And maybe we don't need a label or we don't need a publisher. We will do the deals that we need. And a lot of managers now say, do you know what? Domestic market, we can do it all ourselves. But we do deals to get that global stuff that we talked about earlier. We can manage everything in our home territory. But so the most important bit of the deal, when we do a label deal, question one is, what international reach do you have? We can do home territory ourselves. We're, hiring, we're getting you involved to go global. So managers are getting more involved. They're doing more strategy. They're doing more day-to-day -day work. However, this is a challenge for managers, many of whom used to be part-time. They did management on the side. They worked at a label or they were a promoter, and they managed some artists on the side. Management is becoming a full-time activity. Also, we talked earlier about the different skills a manager requires. That probably doesn't sit in one brain. So now you need management teams who can bring the different skills to the table. Management companies now are having their own marketing teams, their own director fan teams, their own social media teams. So this is a big challenge for management. It's a huge opportunity, but it's a big challenge. And one question lots of managers are having to ask is, can I afford to do all of this on a 20% cut? Or do I need a bigger cut? And what's that conversation going to sound like? When I go to the artist and say, do you know what? I've just invested two members of staff full time for three years. It's going to take me a long time to make that back on 20%. So these are the conversations that managers are having to have. And I think the artist management relationship and then the management label relationship, for me, they're evolving and they're evolving in really interesting ways. And as someone who writes about the music industry, I think that's the most interesting thing. Okay, and we, we can all sit around and wait for Spotify and Apple Music to work out how we're going to make money in the future. But actually, I think the real challenge is working out the deals that artists and managers and labels do with each other, the way we capitalize on all of those revenue streams, and then the way we share the rewards when they come. Um, are there any questions about any of that or anything else we've covered today? Remember, this is what's still to come from me tomorrow. We're going to talk about the digital market and digital licensing. We're going to talk a little bit about evolving your business, which will return to what I've just been talking about before I hand over to my colleagues who are going to uh, lead the debate for the second half of the free day program. Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and look out for all the stuff. Come back tomorrow with those questions and debates and I'll see you tomorrow morning to talk about...